field using genetics to manage Lake Erie walleye fisheries. This is a brand new webinar series called Freshwater Science that will highlight Ohio Sea Grant and partnering scientists every month. Every quarter is a different focus from human health and fish farming to harmful algal blooms and human decision making, bringing applied research to the public on issues that affect our Lake Erie communities. I am Jill Gentis Benicki from Ohio Sea Grant Stone Laboratory, and joining me today is Dr. Stu Lutzen from the Aquatic Ecology Laboratory at The Ohio State University. Dr. Ludson is a professor at Ohio State's Department of Evolution, Ecology, and Organismal Biology. Before coming to Ohio State, he led research as a fisheries biologist within NOAA's Great Lakes Environmental Research Laboratory. His research explores the mechanisms that regulate fish populations and community dynamics in freshwater and marine ecosystems. We're delighted to have Dr. Ludson here today to discuss his research on genetics and walleye populations. Before we get started, a few logistical mentions about the webinar. During our presentation, all participants will be in a listen-only mode. Afterwards, at about 12.20, I'll conduct a question and answer session. If you'd like to ask a question during the presentation, please feel free to pull up the chat feature anytime during his, Dr. Letson's talk, and I will collect and pose your questions out to him at the end of his presentation. As a reminder, this webinar has auto captioning and is being recorded to be posted onto our website for later viewing. Also, we'll post a webinar survey in the chat feature toward the end of the half an hour. Please take a few minutes after the webinar to fill out that survey. It will help us continue to bring you better webinars. So without any further delay, I'd like to introduce Dr. Stu Lutzen from Ohio State University, who will present using genetics to manage Lake Erie walleye fisheries. All right, Dr. Lutzen. All right, thank you, Jill. Um, let's see if we get this showing here. Oh boy, let's see what happens here. Um, is that, can you guys see the presentation okay? It looks great. All right, perfect. Thank you, Jill. Oh, oh, hold on, sorry. I'm seeing presenter mode, so presenter if you just mode. want to switch displays. Yeah, give me one second here. How's that? Still there. Oh, boy. Still presenter right. mode. All right, technical errors. Let me stop my share real quick. Just practice this too. It's great. Um, let's see. I got a thousand windows open up. This is the problem. Let's try this. What are you seeing now? That's the correct version. Thank you. This is good. Thank you. I'm had my controls here. All right, all good? Okay. All um, good. Thank you. Um, hi, welcome everybody. I, I'm excited to have this opportunity to chat with you and I appreciate you taking the time to um, listen to what I have to say here. Um, what I wanna do today is talk about a project uh, that recently wrapped up in which um, my collaborators and I sought to help identify um, some ways to improve walleye management on Lake Erie and essentially uh, we sought to develop a, a novel molecular tool that can help determine which local spawning populations or stocks are contributing to uh, the fisheries in Lake Erie. And there's a whole bunch of people that have been involved in this research, as you can see by this, this author list. But I want to uh, give a, a shout out to Peter Euclid, uh, who's now over at Purdue University, who um, really is the person who did the, the work for this project, did all the genetics, wrote the papers. And if it wasn't for him, I would not be able to be here um, talking. So figure out how to advance, which is not seeming to work here very well. All right, something is, all right. I'll do it a different way than I was thinking. Uh, I just wanna thank the Ohio Sea Grant for funding uh, this research. Um, they were, um, uh, the primary funding source backwards with additional monetary support provided by the Ohio Division of Wildlife through the Sport Fish Restoration Act. And they, the Division of Wildlife helped jumpstart the genetics that I'm going to talk about here. And then uh, there's a whole variety of agencies uh, from the Lake Erie Committee that helped provide walleye that we used um, for this work. So to begin, I want to uh, 
talk a little bit about something that I call human-induced rapid environmental change. And you'll see this uh, acronym HIRIC here. Essentially, Lake Erie, like most uh, large aquatic and terrestrial ecosystems, has been experiencing uh, ecosystem change at the expense of human activities in the watershed. So in Lake Erie, we've had nutrient pollution that's um, led to harmful algal bloom formations, hypoxic zones or areas of low oxygen in the middle of central Lake Erie, climate warming's led to reduced ice cover, and we've had a whole host of invasive species that have potentially, um, hold the potential to alter habitat availability to fish populations. With these uh, changes, the expectation is that habitat quality that might be able to support fish populations, including walleye, might um, change. And so I'm gonna try to illustrate how just some, some of these ideas of, of how high rec or human induced rapid environmental change might influence walleye's population um, in ways that differ from one lake basin to the other. So if we look at um, uh, a little table here where I've got west central and eastern basins of Lake Erie and how those might be expected to respond to human induced rapid environmental change where we might have inc uh, increased warming leading to um, improved thermal habitat as indicated by these positive arrows um, increased nutrient runoff would be expected to lead to more food for things like larval yellow perch that might have benefits um, in the lake, especially in the East Basin, which is typically unproductive. And then we've had other uh, changes like the establishment of invasive white perch that have been increasing predation risk, which while an up arrow here would be bad for walleye because if you have more predators out there that can feed on young walleye, that might be a negative thing. What you can take home from the, if we just look at this example of, of the larval stage, is that we can see already differences occurring potentially between the west and eastern basins, where the east basin, which is typically cold and unproductive, might benefit actually from more warming and more nutrient inputs into the lake. Whereas in the uh, western basin, um, you might have offsetting effects, increased predation risk, offsetting any positive effects associated with increasing temperature. If we think about a different life stage, though, and think about adult walleye, we might we see even more stark contrasts in terms of expectations, um, in terms of habitat between basins. The expectation is that increased warming and increased nutrient pollution and, and harmful algal blooms in the Western basin would be bad for walleye because walleye like cool water temperatures, they need them to grow and the harmful algal blooms might reduce foraging habitat for them. So an already warm productive basin would benefit, or excuse me, would be hurt potentially by continued nutrient pollution and climate warming. Whereas in the East, we might find the populations there might actually benefit because it's again, a cold unproductive um, place. So the punchline from this is that different life stages of walleye might benefit or not benefit from uh, human induced rapid environmental change. And then we can expect changes between uh, lake basins with possibly a positive effect in the East and a negative effect in the West. Well, the, while we don't quite have definitive linkages between how environmental changes have been affecting Lake Erie's walleye population. Some recent catch data, commercial catch data from the lake suggests that there may be some habitat changes that are altering fisheries catches. So basically you're looking at some data that were uh, compiled by the Lake Erie Walleye Task Group where we've got um, commercial harvest as a measure of catch per unit effort. On the, the left set of panels, we've got the commercial harvest is a proportional basis, same data just presented in a different way in the right panels. And we're basically looking at catch trends in Western Central Lake Erie here and the Eastern Basin. And what you can take home from this is that in the Western Basin, fisheries catches, at least up at the time that this data were, these data were collected, have been declining um, over, overall. Whereas in the Eastern Basin, we've seen an uptick in production um, whether proportionally or in terms of CPUE in, in the lake. The reasons underlying this, these changes though remain uncertain. So one of the things we don't know is if that, if, if whether the increase in the East and the decrease in catch rates in the West is simply, doing to, is simply due to adult walleye 
moving from the West Basin and spending more time in the East Basin, or perhaps conditions for larvae have increased and reproductive success has increased, that the increases in the East are due to more local production coming out of that basin because of more food and warmer temperatures for young. This understanding and attaining that understanding is important because if it can help determine um, which stocks are worth protecting in the lake and, and help guide management. And I'm gonna to try to clarify this statement with just a hypothetical example here. So if we look at a picture of, of Lake Erie here and it's, it's lake basins, and we hypothetically assume that there are spawning stocks in the Western Basin and the Eastern Basin that are all contributing recruits to the fishery in equal proportions. So the same size uh, symbols here indicate that each of these six stocks are contributing recruits to the fishery equally. If we have continued human induced rapid environmental change that perhaps leads to a reduction in the Western Basin fisheries, well, the nice thing is that you still have potentially productive fisheries in the east that other stocks could potentially compensate for losses that might come in, in, in the western basin stocks and, and the eastern basin fisheries in this example could continue on. However, if we have a different situation, and this is one that we think is the case that's happening in the lake, at least going into this study, if we, we think that the, 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 there's these Western Basin stocks that are disproportionately contributing recruits to lake-wide population and supporting the Eastern Basin fisheries so that local production in the East is low, which is what we think is the case, and we know that the, the fisheries in the East are supported or think are supported by these West Basin fisheries, if we lose these Western Basin stocks because of degraded habitat and, and warming, well, then we run the risk of fisheries collapse. So it's really important to begin for management agencies to begin to understand which stocks are contributing recruits to their recreational and commercial fisheries. So with that in mind, our central uh, question that we, we sought to ask, and, and I'll talk about in this, in this particular presentation is, um, are Eastern Basin, Eastern Basin, Eastern Lake Erie's fisheries supported by local production, or, are this, or, or are these fisheries supported by fish that originated in the West Basin? And again, we focused on Eastern Lake Erie for a few different reasons. The first is that Lake Erie are currently managed as a single stock by the Lake Erie Committee agencies, as you can see listed below here. And it's not just that they're managed as a single stock, but the East Basin stocks are not and have historically not been considered important producers to the lake-wide population. They're essentially not really considered in, in management planning. And given these, these trends that I, I showed you in terms of fisheries harvest, a decrease in the West and increase in the East, it's now time we answer the question and begin to understand why do we see these differences and, and which stocks are contributing to the East Basin fisheries. So to answer this question, um, we basically undertook two, two different steps using a molecular tool. The first step was basically to try to find a, a genetic marker or something that we call a natural tag that could discriminate or help differentiate among local spawning populations or stocks across the lake. So finding tools that might be able to differentiate the Maumee River from the Sandusky River spawning stock from the, the, the Ontario Grand River stock out east. And then with such a marker, we could then use those markers um, to basically determine the origin of fish that are captured in Lake Erie's um, recreational and commercial fisheries. So we don't know the origins of fish captured in those, those, those fisheries, but this tool might give us a way to do it. So what I wanna do is present some methods and results in terms of these two processes before wrapping things up. So to just give you a slight bit more context on, on Lake Erie walleye. We know that there are lots of Lake Erie walleye local spawning populations or, or local spawning stocks that are out there. So we've got um, a variety of stocks in the West Basin um, that we know are, are produce a lot of fish. There's a, um, a Grand River spawning stock that we're aware of. And then there's lots of stocks over in the East Basin that also potentially could 
um, contribute recruits to the fishery. Um, and I do want to note that there's the Grand River, Ohio, and the Grand River, Ontario. And so when I say the Grand River from here on out, I'm really referring to this Ontario side of things, because this will pop up a little bit later. So while we know that fish are spawning mostly in, in all these locations with the biggest populations in the West, um, and we, we don't know the degree to which the Western Basin stocks contribute to the Eastern Basin fisheries. So we know that on an annual basis, once walleye finish spawning in the West Basin, as temperatures start to warm, they leave the hot Western Basin in search of food and cooler temperatures and migrate over to the East Basin. So we know there's documented movement of walleye to the East, but we don't know whether or not those fish are actually captured by the recreational commercial uh, 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 fishing vessels. So the goal was to basically develop a, uh, what we call a high throughput next generation molecular approach to help ideally discriminate among stocks. So specifically what Peter um, put together and developed was this restriction site associated DNA sequences, sequencing approach, this rad seek approach, where essentially um, we we're able to generate thousands of different, uh, we call haplotypes or short DNA fragments that ideally could help differentiate among um, local spawning populations. And if we can use genetics as a marker to differentiate between these, between these different walleye spawning populations, we then would have a tool potentially that could allow us to type back or assign individuals of unknown origin back to um, a basin or, or site of known origin. So the way this uh, worked is that basically um, what we call a, a baited rapture panel was created, which essentially was a slimmed down version of all the possible loci out there that, that, that basically consisted only of what we call useful genetic markers. So Peter and his work found about almost 44,000 different loci in, a, in a, a sample of walleye from Lake Erie that was collected across the lake. And of those 44,000, there's about 12,000 of them that, that consistently showed up and showed some polymorphism, some, some variation um, in their genetic signatures that might be useful for discriminating between these local spawning populations. And so for the remainder of the work, we basically used, used this, these 12,000 um, uh, loci to, uh, to basically look for differences among our spawning populations. And that saved a bunch of time and money because we didn't have to look at these other 30,000 or so low side. So with this baited rapture panel, we then could develop genetic signatures or genetic, um, uh, uh, a suite of genetic markers that can discriminate among stocks. So essentially we, we had about 400 individuals that were provided by state and provincial agencies that, um, that were collected in the spawning location during the spawning season um, during 2016 to 2018 from across the lake. And by looking at these 12,000 loci for all these individuals, we hoped that there would be some kind of genetic signature that would help differentiate the Maumee River from the Sandusky River from the Detroit River, et cetera. What we found, um, unfortunately, was that we were not able to use our genetic signatures to discriminate among individual stocks within basins. So despite having 12,000 plus potential uh, markers out there, the ability to discriminate stocks within the Western and Central basins was low. And you can see that all these purple colors here are the different Western and Central basin stocks sitting on top of each other. And the, like, the reason for this is these, these stocks are, are um, genetically evolutionary young um, and in close location. And so it's not all that surprising that we can't differentiate. The same case occurred for the East Basin stocks. So these green stocks here are all the East Basin ones, with exception of this Grand River Ontario stock. So the Grand River up on the North, on the North Shore. So not having the ability to differentiate the Maumee River from the Sandusky from the Ohio Reefs, for example, we decided to take a different approach and, and broaden our spatial scale. And instead of focusing on individual stocks, we sought to look for 
um, basin-wide genetic signatures that might be able to um, differentiate. And here's where we found some success. So when we look at our 12,000 loci and, 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 and cluster them, what we found are basically three to four clusters of fish here. All your West Basin stocks and central and this Grand River in Ohio kind of cluster out with one another. The East Basin stocks cluster out with one another, with exception of this Grand River stock that may be two subpopulations, but it's, it's unique enough. And if we do our classifications at the, at the level of the basin and group all the the East Basin stocks is, is, is greens and, the, and the, all the West Basin stocks that are purple together and the Grand River stock is one, we had great classification accuracy. We can discriminate with between 95 and 100% success. And just to show you how this kind of lays out, that these clusters are meaningful, everything in purple here are basically the, the cluster had, had similar genetics. And so you can see the Western and central basin stocks are forming one cluster. The east basin stocks here in green essentially are cluster two, and then cluster three and four is really just a, a population in the Grand River. So now we ask the question, given the ability to differentiate among these, these three major areas, the Grand River, the east, uh, the rest of the east basin and, and the west slash central basin, where do um, the fish that are captured in the fisheries originate from? So basically we analyzed the genetics of about uh, 1300 walleye that were collected by state by the New York State DEC and the Ontario Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry, um, which were collected in, in commercial and recreational fisheries during 2016 to 2018. And the, the purple dots on here, um, indicate the, the, the relative size of catches. So a big circle here means a lot of fish were captured in one location in this one, in one sampling event. A bullseye pattern down on the bottom here for the recreational catches indicates that, that, that there were four samples collected in that time at that location and, and, the, the, very, and the catches varied from being really small to a little bit wider. With these um, commercial and recreational catches, we basically looked at variation in catch um, through the season in 2017. So we had a lot of fish captured in 2017 in, in New York's recreational fisheries and Ontario's commercial fisheries. So we could look at within year variation by focusing on 2017. And then by focusing on uh, July, where we had good catches in 2016, 17, and 18, we could look at intra-annual variation, differences among years in terms of catches. So when we look at the output from um, the analyses of these 1,271 individuals and ask how they type out um, and how they're assigned, we see that there's a lot of variation through both space and time. So complex graph that I'll walk you through here, but essentially you're looking at um, the Eastern basin of Lake Erie um, and the proportion of catches in, any, in, in, in these larger catch grids um, that were part from that that came from the east basin in green or from the west slash central basin in purple. And to kind of distill this down, what we found is that in the springtime during May and June, most of the catch in the recreational commercial fisheries uh, came from fish that were produced in the east basin. So you see a lot of green in this picture. So there's a lot of local production supporting catches in the springtime. During the summertime, July, August, and September, however, we see a flip-flop where now we see West Basin fish comprising most of the uh, recreational and commercial fisheries um, during, during the peak catch season in July, August, and September. And I do want to say that in general, there was, and there was no statistical differences in terms of the proportions um, that the West Basin fish contributed between the recreational commercial fisheries. So the catches in both fisheries were pretty consistent, um, you know, uh, it, it, relative to the bullets I just explained. To kind of help just give you a different way to view those same data, um, here's a plot of the proportion of West Basin fish um, in different months um, for both the commercial and recreational fisheries. And what you can see is that in May and June, the proportion of West Basin fish in both fisheries is pretty low. 
again, increasing with sort of about 70% on average of the catch coming from the West Basin during um, the peak catch season in, in uh, August and September, and then a decline into October. And these data points off to the right are essentially um, all West Basin fish, but the sample sizes are pretty low, only about 30 individuals here. So I don't know how representative they are. Despite the seasonal trend, we didn't see any evidence for consistency in terms of which basins are contributing individuals to the July fisheries. So in, in July of 2016, most of the fish that were captured in July came or were originated in the East Basin. Whereas in July of 2017, there was an equal mix. Whereas in July of 2018, most of the fish were captured in the West Basin. So what this points to is that these fish are mobile and the relative contributions of these fish to the fisheries in any given year can change through time. And this suggests the need to you know, continually monitor relative stock contributions. And the last interesting result that we found was that um, the proportion of fish that came from the West Basin varied across a longitudinal gradient. So if we take and we look in the Eastern Basin um, and look from a West to East gradient within that basin, we see that on the Western end of the East Basin, most of the fish captured there were Western Basin fish. And those are primarily commercial fish, commercially caught fish. Whereas in the Eastern Basin, most of the fish were primarily originated there. So there is some spatial variation as well. So to wrap things up then, and what this, all, this, what this all means is basically that as we had predicted, we found evidence that indicate that not only are walleye moving from west to east, but they're actually contributing to both the recreational and com commercial fisheries. These contributions were greatest during um, July through September, um, although there was some interannual variation that we saw in terms of these contributions. And it's 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 and, and ultimately what this confirms is that that mass movement, seasonal movement of fish from the west to the east, um, is actually changing the the the, the uh, fisheries and their their catches. The surprising um, thing we found is that East Basin stocks are important. So these, as I mentioned earlier in the talk, these stocks are generally thought to be small and not really contributing much to the fisheries, but that's not really the case here. We found that the East Basin stocks were the most contrib important contributor to the fisheries during the springtime in the Eastern Basin, and they were the predominant catch in the far Eastern Basin recreational catches. So these stocks need to be considered. What this ultimately points to is the need for, to, for agencies to move away from single, single stock management and to start to think about something like multi-stock management where they're, they're managing what we call sort of a, a portfolio of, um, of stocks here. So just like a, a, a good investor will have a diversity of stocks in which he, she, or they invest their, their money, we want the same thing to happen in Lake Erie's um, fisheries where we protect not only the important West Basin stocks, but we also want to protect stocks like the East Basin ones that are smaller, but we know that are contributing to the fisheries in some seasons, some months, or, or in, in specific locations. And the need to protect this stock diversity is really important given that the lake is changing at the expense of human-induced um, uh, human induced rapid environmental uh, stressors. So um, as if the West Basin continues to become degraded with climate warming and the East Basin continues to increase, we wanna make sure that we're protecting um, that East Basin stock from overfishing. And then finally, what, one of the things I think we're proud of as a group is that we've now helped uh, better position agencies to implement uh, multi-stock management by producing this, this molecular tool um, that can determine stock origins, at least at, at a broad spatial scale. Um, and the methods that Peter um, and colleagues have developed and continuing to develop will um, allow for even faster and more rapid um, processing of, of, um, of samples at a lower cost, which is pretty exciting. So with that, that's all I have. I really appreciate you um, paying attention and I'm happy to answer any questions if, if time exists.
All right, thanks, Stu. Um, <clears throat> we have gotten quite a few questions, so let me get started and ask uh, Dr. Lutzen as many as we can. And what questions he may not be able to answer today, we'll post later on on the website with his answers. Um, first question, I, there were a couple dealing with um, uh, some of the fish migration. One, one of the questions, it was just a clarifying question. Do they, do um, the fish populations move west to east in one day or is it a week long event? Um, so I, I don't have the data in front of me to be able to answer that perfectly well, but I'm going to, I'm going to say that the movement from west to east occurs over, um, I would say a span of, of weeks to months but it can occur over the course of days. So while I have the ability to migrate really long distances, and I think you'll find a lot of interannual, um, you'll, you'll find a lot of variation among individuals in terms of movement, but it's generally a gradual seasonal movement, I would say over the course of you know, more on the order of weeks to months. Okay, thank you. Um, another question was, uh, could there have been thermal differences among years linked to when Western Basin fish, oh, sorry, I uh, was reading it and it, it left me. Um, could there have been uh, thermal differences among years, could there have been thermal differences among years linked to when Western Basin fish are moving east? Um, so the, answer, the, the short answer is yes, and it's something I, don't think we actually looked at, but I had a PhD student, David Dippold, who was using, um, looking at, at changes in the, in the uh, Western Basin and Central Basin fisheries as, as, a, as a function of temperature. And one of the things that we found is that the movement out of the West Basin does um, depend on temperature to a large degree. So if you have rapid warming in the springtime, um, which is what we'd expect with, with climate change, um, the movement out of the West Basin happens sooner than, than if not, and you get higher catches sooner in, in the, at least the central basin fishery. So I would presume the same thing would happen over in the eastern, eastern basin fisheries as well. And, and it's, it's very possible that that interannual variation just could simply be linked to um, temperature driven movements. Okay. Um, another question that we had was dealing with the um, was uh, dealing with the um, Ballville Dam. Mm -hmm. We had a couple questions about with the absence of now that Ball Ballville Dam, how might Sandusky River walleye populations change? Uh, it's a good question, and that's something that I, I think that the, the Division of Wildlife and, and a lot of the other Lake Erie Committee agencies are excited to, to get the answer to. So um, my impression is that the, you know, from the, the literature is that, that the Sandusky River spawning stock used to be pretty big historically, and then when the, the Ballville Dam was put in place, um, it may have cut off access to um, some critical and useful spawning habitat. Um, and now with that dam being out, out of out removed, the expectation and the hope is that more walleye will use that Sandusky River, and and um, and there'll be successful recruitment and survival of young out of there. Um, unfortunately, we don't have the answer yet as to what um, what contributions that Sandusky River stock is making to any of the fisheries, but it's something that is, is certainly being investigated, um, and and the hope would be that there'll be a, you know. An, an increase in the walleye population because you have this this new other stock potentially adding adding recruits, but um, that it'll be an exciting ten years to you know to see what what happens there. All right. Um, another question that we got was, um, what is acoustic? To tell, I can never say it today. <laughs> Telemetry, yeah. Telemetry, thank you. Telemetry telling us that is different from genetics or do they reinforce each other in terms of distribution and abundance of different stocks? Um, so um, I had a former PhD student, Andrew Bade, who did a lot of telemetry work um, looking at, at uh, reproductive movements and behavior um, of walleye. And couple of things that the telemetry data have, have shown us is that um, walleye in general um, 
demonstrate what we call uh, spawning site fidelity. So they're going to come back not only to, to the same river year in and year out, but the, we actually have natal spawning site fidelity. They're, they're going to come back to the same river in which they spawned. Um, the, the spawning site fidelity and back coming back to the natal river, though, is, is not perfect. And so one of the reasons that genetics can't differentiate between um, uh, the Maumee River, for example, and the Sandusky River and the Ohio Reef Complex within a basin is because there's a, there is sometimes straying. And that's something that telemetry showed us is that occasionally you'll have a, a fish that might've historically been spawning in the Sandusky River um, that may use the Maumee River, for example. And that, and, and even just a few individuals straying from one spawning location to another can lead to the genetic signature getting um, mixed up and then you can't differentiate among stocks. So the telemetry has shown us that there's a lot of site fidelity, but it's imperfect. There's some straying and that can explain why we have weak genetic signatures and the inability to, to um, differentiate within lake basins. The other telemetry data are confirming um, the, 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 the main message of, of today's talk and the idea that fish do migrate on an annual basis, you know, from west to east, and they seem to be, we think, targeting preferred prey and, and optimal feeding conditions, thermal habitat for growth. And so from that perspective, there's a nice match between what the telemetry data is suggesting relative to movements and what our, our genetics is suggesting relative to, to movements. Okay. Um, two more questions um, before our time is up. Um, first one is, it, um, is just a follow-up to a couple other questions earlier on. Um, do you have an, an idea of what age the walleye are when they move east? Um, yeah, so, so I, I know there's a whole bunch of Division of Wildlife folks on, on the call that could probably answer this question better. Um, my general impression is that they, while I are, when they're one to two years old, especially one, you know, just hatched through at least a year of life, they're hanging pretty local, but by around age two, um, they're, they're, um, especially females because they're a little bit bigger, they're starting to move, um, in, into cooler waters, um, with males maybe moving over at age three or so, um, that may be changing a little. And again, it's going to be year dependent because of what temperatures um, are like. Um, and, and it's all linked to physiology of these fish. So a bigger walleye needs cooler temperatures that grow optimally. And so if, a, if you have a young, if you have a two-year-old that's growing really fast, um, taking advantage of the warm temperatures, at some point, it's going to need cooler temperatures to maintain um, and take care of its metabolic needs and, and, and it'll need more food and it may end up leaving a little bit earlier. Um, so there's some, it's not, there's some variation within an age, but roughly I'd say two and three years old is when, when these things start moving out. Okay. Um, one last question. And we had talked about recreational walleye fishing, but could you talk a little bit about the extent of commercial walleye fishing on the lake and its impact in the overall fisheries? Yeah, so what, I, what I'm, what I'm going to say is that one of the great things that has occurred over the past, uh, I'll say, 40 years um, are, are agencies from both sides of the border, you, have, you know, the Ontario Ministry of Natural Resources and all the, the state agencies on the U.S. side, um, following a, a really, the walleye population being in real poor shape during the early 70s, they adapted um, a, a, a nice interjurisdictional management um, uh, setup that really kicked into gear in the mid-1980s. And so there is commercial fishing that's substantial on in Lake Erie, there's recreational fishing that's substantial in Lake Erie. Um, but I'm gonna say that both fisheries are managed in a way that the impact of any one fishery is not better, worse or better than the other. So I think that um, exploitation rates are, are, are kept, I believe the, the number's under 20%, but it's kept under a level in which I don't think that there's any negative effect. And if anything, even a positive effect of both commercial fishing and, and 
and, and recreational fishing because it's removing biomass that can allow other walleye to grow and, and be productive. So, so there's certainly an impact, but nothing that I would call is being detrimental. All right. Well, thank you. Uh, well, thank you for answering these questions. We had a, a few other ones and I'll send those over to you if you don't mind, uh, Dr. Ledson, and we'll get those questions answered. Um, I want to thank Dr. Ledson for his willingness to talk to us today about his walleye research. It was really an excellent discussion. Also, a, thank, a, a big thank you to Christina Dickus for her work organizing this webinar series. I did want to also remind everyone that our survey URL is, for this webinar is in the chat feature, so please take a few minutes to fill that out. Uh, this webinar series is sponsored by Ohio Sea Grant and will continue next month with Dr. Uh, Pundamart from uh, Bowling Green State University, who will be talking about her research to detect a pathogen found in fish farms. Uh, the registration link is in the chat. Uh, thank you again, Dr. Letson, and all the participants on this webinar. We hope this was beneficial and hope you'll join us again in an upcoming webinar. Uh, thank you and have a great afternoon. Thanks again, Dr. Letson. Thank you all as well. Appreciate it.